بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا قوا انفسكم واهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجاره عليها ملائكة غلاب شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون صدق الله العظيم Respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah for this opportunity to speak about something extremely important and one of the most important responsibilities that we have as family head of the household you can say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses somebody with a gift the gift of children and you can really understand the reality of this gift from those people who don't have this what means and what Asbab and what things people are ready to do to have children. Think about it. People go to the graves of awliya, right? People spend millions of dollars. They put themselves in shirk. They put themselves in kufr. They'll even kill. They'll even do whatever you can imagine that we just want to have a child. They are, I mean, people go to amazing limits to have this bounty. I mean, if we want to understand the greatness of this blessing is look at the Anbiya alayhim salam An example is Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. Another example is Sayyidina Zakariya alayhi salam. That their du'as for children have been recorded in the Qur'an. Yani, it was such a blessing of this world that those who live in this world and they are not blessed with this bounty, some of them feel as if we did not even live in this world. Imagine that you have the Anbiya alayhim salam making dua for this ni'mat. But just as tremendous of a ni'mat this is, similarly is the responsibility and the gravity of fulfilling and preserving this amanat. I want to read to you a quote of Imam Ghazali. He says something amazing about what is a child. A child is what? For some people, unfortunately, who it's not a problem for them, or children come easy, they probably don't understand. But for those who have difficulty, they understand. But Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he mentions, he says, As-sabiyu amanatun inda walidayhi. He says, this child is actually amanat that Allah has given you. Wa qalbuhu tahirun. جَوْهَرَةٌ نَفِيسَةٌ خَالِيَةٌ عَنْ كُلِّ نَقْشٍ وَسُورَةٌ And the child is like the example of an uncut diamond. And this diamond and this gem can take any shape that you etch inside of it. If you want to cut this diamond into any shape, it will make that shape, it will become what you want it to become. And Allah Ta'ala has given it to you to make it into something. وَهُوَ قَابِرٌ لِكُلِّ نَقْشِ It can take any great engraving. وَمَائِلٌ إِلَىٰ كُلِّ مَا يُمَالُ إِلَيْهِ And it can incline towards anything that you incline that child towards. فَإِنْ عُوِّذَ الْخَيْرِ نَشَأَ عَلَيْهِ If that child is made accustomed to good things, that child will become good. وَسَعِدَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ أَبَوَاهُ And... Now look at what he says. By the goodness of that child, the mother and father of that child will have happiness in this life and in the hereafter. It's not even talking about the child. It's talking about the parents of the child. And if that child is neglected, and neglected like you would neglect some, some goat or some sheep, then what would happen? 
shaqiya wa halaka, then you will be wretched, and you will be destroyed, and the child will be destroyed. وَكَانَ الْوِزْرُ فِي رَقَبَةِ الْقَيِّمِ عَلَيْهِ And the main sin and heaviness, the main responsibility of this guna, right? this harm that has been caused to society, this harm that has been caused to the world, it will fall on the shoulders of parents. My dear brothers and sisters, the hundreds of thousands of people that we see in prison, hundreds and thousands of people that we see in prisons, do we know when we blame somebody, we said, that prisoner, that mujrim, that criminal, right? That killer, that murderer, that rapist, that blah, blah, blah. And we have all different various names and we have such hatred in our hearts. But in reality, there is no one to blame but the parents of that person. And very interestingly, almost one third of the people who are in prisons based on any crime that they have committed, they either come from a household that has no parents, or both parents are working, or the father was never there, or the mother was never there, or both, or mother and father were there, but they were drug addicts. Look at the statistics. From this we understand, subhanAllah, that the crime that we see, the craziness that we see actually in the world, a majority of that crime, we can say if one third of the people that are in prison, they're there because of the neglect of parents. Then you can say one third, you can almost make an analogy, that one third of all of the crime that's in the world, and the problems that are in the world, probably the cause, if you go back, it was because of lack of tarbiyat somewhere down the line. It was lack of building that strong foundation of goodness. That strong foundation of righteousness. That strong foundation of right, being accustomed to a good discipline in righteousness. So, this matter of tarbiyat, tarbiyatul awlad, this is what the topic of discussion today is. The proper and Islamic upbringing of children. This is a matter, my dear brothers and sisters, that is not a mustahab. It is not something that is good for you to do. It is not something recommended for you to do. It is not something that is nice. Okay, if you spend some time with your kids, it's very good. You should spend some time with your kids. It's something good. This is a fard. It is fard. Just like praying namaz is fard. Yes, just like fasting in the Ramadan is fard. Just like doing hajj and paying zakat is fard. Making tarbiyat of your children if Allah has given them to you is fard. And neglect of this is haram. And it is such a haram that it not only affects your life, it will affect your, your, your akhirat as well. And it will affect, in essence, the entire world and the entire society. What we are seeing in society. What we see in society, a major, and I guarantee, go ahead and study this. Go ahead and look into this. And you will see. Research this. Study this. And you will come to the conclusion that major, major issues that exist in people's and human beings' lives is because of the neglect at the time when specific tarbiyat was supposed to be given. A tree did not give fruit. There was a tree, it's interesting. This was a long time ago. My grandfather, he was very much into gardening. So one time... Uh, I said, you know, Grandpa, what type of tree is this? He said, it's an apple tree. So I said, I've never seen it give apples. So he said something. He said, Bachim, i daracht. He said, i daracht khushkshada. I daracht sohta. I daracht sohta. I was like, what does that mean? He said, when the time when they were supposed to be given the proper care, he said, this, this, this tree is burned out. I said, what does that mean? He said, when there was pro time of proper, you know, fertilizer it was supposed to be given, Proper water, it was supposed to be. Now, if it even gives fruit, the fruit will not be proper. Because from the essential stage, it was not given that proper upbringing. And the, th this was the word he used. In other words, this tree is burned out. Human beings, they get burned out. When the proper tarbiyat is not given at the proper and appropriate time. I might have to use some examples that are uh, uh, you know, a little bit you know, uh, graphic, 
But even there was, they were doing an interview of a young girl who went into the wrong direction and she was doing things which are very inappropriate at clubs and selling herself in a way which is destruction of the self, destroying her life, being in clubs, selling herself, and so on. Those who are adults understand what I'm saying. In the interview they asked, and they were doing, you know, she, she didn't want that life. She came and the psychiatrist realized after so much therapy that at the age when that daughter needed love and attention, she was not given that love and attention. Now, psychologically, she's doing these hurtful things to herself. She's doing these damaging things to herself because she has misappropriated the love and attention in this very detrimental and evil way. Because that girl, she was not given the attention and the love of her father at that stage in her life when she needed that attention and that love from her father. And what happened? Now, for that emptiness that exists inside of her heart, she's trying to fill that emptiness with very damaging things. And she is getting attention. But what type of intention is that? She is getting love, but that is not love. This is something which is extremely harmful, psychologically, spiritually, physically. All of it was what? Because at that stage, when she needed that love, she was not receiving that love. Now when that time passed, that tree died, the tree burned. Now whatever can be done, it has become a, 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 a vicious cycle. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is a very great amanat. And this is not something which we can say is recommended. It's not recommended. It's not optional. It's a fault. And the neglect of it is haram. And not only is it haram, it is a crime done upon humanity. I have to, I have to take it to that next level. It is a crime that is done unto humanity. And this is a prophetic command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman. Allah ta'ala says, Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your families from the hellfire. This is point number one. Point number two is what Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions in the hadith of Bukhari Sharif. Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi. Every single one of you is a shepherd. And every one of you will be asked about his flock. The beautiful wording of the Messenger, Allahu Akbar. Look at the word he uses. He didn't say, every one of you is a king, or every one of you is, you know, a boss. He said, you're a, a shepherd, and you have a flock. Because, you know, look at the word. Because if a shepherd looking after goats and sheep, if one minute he is neglectful of the sheep, the wolf is going to catch and eat the sheep. Isn't it? So look at the word that the Prophet used. Kullukum ra'in. Every one of you is a shepherd. Right? Chopan. Every one of you is a shepherd. Wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi. And you'll be asked about your flock. You're going to be asked. And what is, how is a shepherd always concerned about the sheep? Always worried that, you know, should it be that the sheep is, you know, gone too far because there, you know, the wolf is going to catch him and eat him. And another important thing is, some of us, what is the meaning of tarbiyah? We fulfill some responsibilities and we neglect some. The tarbiyah of children doesn't mean that you put clothes on their back, you feed them, you give them water, you give them shelter. Because this type of tarbiyah, even the farmer is giving to his chickens. Right? Even the shepherd is giving to his goats. This is a human being, it's not a goat. It's not a sheep. It's not a camel. You give them food. You give them water. They get you khair. What else you want? Or kya chahiye? I gave him everything that he wants. This is not the way. It's not a sheep. It's a human being. They need love. It's hard. One time, I was uh, speaking to a very close friend of mine. He's almost, he's a friend, but he's almost like an older brother, and he's like a mentor. So I was complaining about the kids. I said, oh man, these kids... You know, I have to do this and that. And then he said, why do you have kids? Why did you have them? 
when you know that you have to spend time with them. You have to, to you know, you know. Sometimes what I'm afraid of, I'm always reading. I'm always preparing. Sometimes I'm reading. And Baba, you know, I just look at look at this painting. Look at this uh, coloring I did. Baba, look at. Okay, okay, just give me one minute. Just doing it like this. Just that what you just did. What it does to the child, we can't ex even explain. That that just that neglect of the father can be. You know what? My father doesn't even care. And that can, Yanif, my dear brothers and sisters, and it's hard for me. I'm a parent. I have three children of my own. It's hard. It's never, it's not easy. You know, somebody, somebody asked, a oh, very great sheikh, a very great scholar, said, Sheikh, tell me about tarbiyat of children. He said, don't ask me. He had like 10,000 students and, you know, you know, all, all disciples and students and all the... He said, don't ask me. He said, he said, this is the hardest thing in the world. Because just that, you know... And I know everybody here, all of you that have now white beard or white hair or you're a father now, uh, now you are all one's children. Tell me, is this true or not? You never forget that day when somebody did you wrong when you're a kid. You never forget it. You ever forget that when somebody did you wrong? When somebody said, get out of here. You know when somebody, you know, bhaga diya. You know? Bhagane ka kabhi bhuta nahi insan. You know, that time when somebody did you bad, a big brother or father or uncle, they give you a smack or they give you a whack. You never forget that. Now understand that your, the children are just like that. And this is why I'm bringing to my attention and to the attention of everybody that we have to be very, very careful that fulfilling some responsibilities of the kids and being neglectful in the other responsibilities doesn't mean tarbiyat. The meaning of tarbiyat, it says here, it's nurturing them, teaching them, training them, giving them manners, right? And the most important thing of what is the tarbiyat of children, the most important thing is as the Prophet ﷺ mentions in the hadith of Tirmidhi, مَا نَحَلَ وَالِدٌ وَلَدًا مِنْ نَحْلٍ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ أَدَبٍ حَسَنٍ That no father or mother gave their children a better gift than good manners. This is the greatest thing that you can give. This is the greatest thing that you can give. And a mistake in this is the tarbiyat should not be part. You give a lot of focus to your son and you don't give any focus to your daughter. Or you give focus to your daughter and you don't give focus. No, this is something which is extremely sensitive. There has to be that balance. But in actuality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually made a special emphasis upon training of daughters, taking care of daughters. Why? Is because in the Arab culture, the daughters were very much neglected. Father and mother thinks, oh, my son is going to be my retirement plan. He's going to work. He's going to take care of me. So I'm going to make effort here. Because, you know, he's going to take care of me when I grow. But my daughter, what? She's just going to go to someone else's house. Who cares? Someone else is going to come marry her and khalas. No. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مَنْ عَالَ ثَلَاثَ بَنَاتٍ فَأَدَّبَهُنَّ وَزَوَّجَهُنَّ وَأَحْسَنَ إِلَيْهِنَّ فَلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Anyone who takes care of three daughters and he teaches them good manners, Islamic akhlaq, good akhlaq, and then marries them off to good husbands and does good to them always, then, فَلَهُلْ jannah. then that man will have jannah. Just by raising your daughters properly, Allah will give you jannah. So one said, what if it, I only have two daughters? Ya Rasulullah. He said, okay, two. He said, what if I only have one? He said, okay, even one. Why? Because this was in a time that people were thinking that girls aren't important. Daughters are not important. They're going to go, they're going to be somebody else's property. Somebody else's property. This is never anybody's property. This is a human being. Your daughter will always be your daughter. And the interesting thing is, the daughters always come back to take care of their Abba. It's the daughters that always remember. It's the daughters that always care. Right? Even though the sons, right, they become their wives. They become the mal of the wife. And we see that a lot. Okay? You know that through tajriba. A lot of the, you know, boys that are raised with so much hope, they become, right, mal of the biwi, right, zanmurid. Some of them become khalas, they become forever gone. 
But the, 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 the women and the daughters, they have such a soft heart. At times, not all the way, or not all the time, sometimes, most of the time, they're the ones with the soft hearts and remember. Another point to understand, brothers and sisters, as parents, is that a lot of people, they think that, you know, reading a lot of Qur'an and praying a lot of nafil and going umrah upon umrah, hajj upon hajj, sadaqah upon sadaqah, you know, building of institutes, building of masajid, wonderful. But what they don't understand is every penny, every dollar, everything that is spent on children, all of that is sadaqah. Every minute that you spend with your children for their tarbiyat is an act of ibadat. Ye ibadat ka kaam hai. Aulad ki tarbiyat ibadat ka kaam hai. We should understand that. And I'm, not, and I'm not saying this in any disrespect. But a lot of brothers, for example, go many, many days in Jamaat. 40, 40 days, 4-4 four, four months going in Jamaat. And then what happens? Completely neglecting, right? That 40 days that you spend with your son, that is not tabligh. That is not ta'aleem. How come we don't make ta'aleem with our children? How, do we, how, do, how come we don't make tabligh to our children? That's not tabligh. That's not ta'aleem. Do it for 40 days. And you will reap the benefits of that. And I'm in, in no way, shape, or form am I taking away from that work. Because this work, it rectifies us. And this is a point that I'm going to be coming to. That when we talk about tarbiyat of children, when you make your own tarbiyat, tarbiyat of children becomes much more easier. Because they see their father. They see their mother. So when a person is going in the path of Allah Ta'ala, or a person is going and spending time, for example, in whatever, going for many, many days. Some people, let's use it another example. Business meetings. Okay, I'm working very hard. I got to be out of the house for four months. I have to do it. This is my life. I have to earn money. Put clothes on your back. Put food on the table. What do you want me to do? I have to be gone for four months. I have to be gone for an entire year. I have a business trip. Right? I have the business trip in Singapore. I have to be away for, you know, uh, one year, two years. Okay, one year, two years. Who's raising your kids? You see what I'm saying? I mean, no, everybody's situation is not perfect. But I want us to understand that this must be from our priorities. That is all I'm saying. I know that everybody's situation is not easy. Certain fathers have to do that. Certain fathers have no choice to do that. I'm not saying about those people that don't have a choice. I'm saying those people that can prioritize, be there with them. Because there'll be a time you don't need to be with them. It's a specific time. And that's it. Once that time is gone, it's really not binding upon you. They're bothered. It's just 15 years or so. That's it. 15 years is not a long time. You got to dedicate that 15 years and you got to say, I have no life. Mothers and fathers, please say this. I tell young sisters of mine, I said, don't be a supermodel, be a role model. Okay? You're worried so much about being a supermodel, right? That you're forgetting to be a role model for your daughter. Your daughter doesn't need a supermodel. Your daughter needs a role model. This is the important thing. Dawat, Talim, Amal, doing good deeds teaching others, propagating Islam. Right? All of these are good things. But doing that for our own children, doing that for our own children is the highest level. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentions, he said, the best luqma, the best sadaqah that you give is the luqma that you put in the mouth of your own child. The best sadaqah a person gives the best sadaqah that a person can give is the luqma that he puts in the mouth of his own wife, the mouth of his own child. And many of us, we become so involved with others. Like we're an example of that. We're coming and I'm teaching you, or I'm teaching in this place, or I'm called in New York, or I'm called in Texas or Canada or wherever it may be, and I go and I'm teaching people and I'm neglecting my own house. What's the use? Allah will not ask me about them. Allah will ask me about my own children. Allah's not going to ask me, did you teach the ICF community? I accept an invitation. This is Mufti Saab's position. Right? This is Mufti Saab's place. I accepted the invitation. But in reality, is this my responsibility? Do I have to do this? No, I don't. It's not fard on me. Because you have somebody who can fulfill that duty. What's fard upon me? My own son. My own daughter. 
my own children. So when we are teaching others and we're forgetting our own, this is a great neglect. This is a great, great, how do you say, uh, uh, travesty. It's a great contradiction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do you command the people to do good and you forget about your own self? So is it correct for me to be teaching people's children and not teach my own children? Teach other people and not teach my own people? This is, doesn't make sense. And there's a very interesting incident that is mentioned by Khalifa al-Mansur. Khalifa al-Mansur, in his time, there were some pious people that were in prison from Banu Umayyah. There were some people, they were in the prison, and they were there for very, very long. 10 years, 20 years. So he said, ما أشد ما مر بكم في هذا الحبس In this imprisonment that you've been in jail for so long, what is the hardest thing upon you? What do you miss the most? What do you think is the most difficult thing on you, the hardest thing upon you? So Khalifa al-Mansur, when he asked him this question, those prisoners were pious people. Some of them were pious people. They were in prison because they're speaking against, right? The zulm of the zalim. They're in prison not because they're criminals. They're in prison because they're speaking against the zulm of the zalim. So they were asked, what is the hardest thing for you here in prison? He says, مَا فَقَدْنَا مِنْ تَرْبِيَةِ أَبْنَائِنَا What we have missed out from the raising and the giving manners of our children. He said, I'm here 20 years, but I was not able to raise my son, raise my daughter, raise my children. The hardest thing for me being in prison is that I was not there to make tarbiyat of my children. Allah Showing, right, the great status that it is just a small window in, your, in their life. After 15 years, they don't really listen to you anyways, okay? That's all you got. 15 years. That chunk of their life you have, you're their hero. You're everything. After 15 years, don't tell me. I know everything. They know everything after 15 years, right? You have Imam Google. They answer all the questions. So, at that point in time, once you miss that, I'm not, I'm not trying to be all gloom and doom here. People are going to get depressed here. I'm not being all gloom and doom. There's always hope. But we're being practical. The most practical time that we get them is that golden stage. Is those, you know, those right, cream, of the, cream of their life is the 15 years when you're their hero. Dad, dad's everything. Dad's Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, he's everybody. Right? He can do anything. Right? And then after that, dad, you know, you're such a... You know, you should do like this, and you should do like that, and how come you don't do this, and how come you... Now they're giving you nasihat. Right? Now they're giving you nasihat. So when you... <laughs> so, so, so get to them, right, when they still have uh, false notions about you. And, brothers and sisters, it is more important duty in this day and age. I know a lot of the parents that are here, you're either from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or anywhere close there, or Afghanistan, or Uzbekistan, or any of those regions. A lot of us are immigrants. Or we're children of immigrants. I'm an immigrant. I was born in Kabul and I came here, so I seen the best of both worlds. I can kind of, I was given tarbiyat not by people here, I was given tarbiyat by the old, old school. Right? My grandfather, he would get so angry when we would speak English in front of him. If we speak English in front of my grandfather, you're dead. They have no akhlaq and adab. They're just talking English in front of you. We could not. That's it. We came from that generation. And this is a complete different generation. This is a complete... We have the internet. You have Facebook. You have Twitter. This destroyed everything. It's changed everything. And in this day and age, it's even more important that we have to... Be more focused of being with them, concerned about them. And why that is? Let me give you an example. Back home, if the grandpa, grandma, father, mother, they tell you, they don't tell you to go pray. They don't tell you to read Quran. They don't tell you to go to the masjid. 
you know what? You don't really turn out that bad. You still know adab of parents. Tell me, is this true or not? If I'm lying, then say, no, 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 that's not right. If your parents, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, if parents don't tell their kids, okay, go to the masjid, read Quran, be good, pray salat, they don't, they don't tell you anything. You know what? You don't turn out that bad. Not that bad. What do I mean by that? You still know who is mother and father. True or false? You know the haq of mother and father. You know the haq of brother and sister. You know silay raham. You know that you have to join the family ties. You know that there's, you know, on the day of Eid, you're not supposed to have a grudge. And all these different things that's part of the culture. It's ingrained in the culture. So even if the people back home, they didn't teach their kids so much, like, you know, hardcore. What happens? You didn't turn out that bad. So a lot of immigrant parents, when they came to America, they think the same thing their parents were thinking in Afghanistan. They're thinking the same thing their parents are thinking in India. That, you know what? That's in the culture over there. They're in the culture. When you walk, the neighbor will tell you, Hey boy, I see what you're doing. I'm going to go tell your father. The store owner, the guy who's the dukandar, the store owner, he's going to say, Hey boy, I know, I'm gonna, I know who your dad is. I'm going to go tell your dad. Everybody had a responsibility. Here in this country, they don't have the responsibility. Nobody cares. We need to wake up and smell the coffee and realize this point that immigrant parents have to realize this and they don't. They just let their kids go to school and they think it's like, you know, whatever. Just like my mom was and dad was to me, I can be to them. You cannot be to them. And my dear brothers and sisters, this is the biggest disconnect. What I see, because I'm from both worlds, I was born there, but I grew up here. And even when I grew up here, I had like two lives. At home, I was living like Afghanistan, literally. And at school, I was my mind and my life was everything like an American. I, would able, I was able to adjust. I was able to have that two kind of, you know, turn it off and turn it back on. I could do that. These kids can't do that. They're Americans. These kids are Americans. They can't do that. And we think, we're thinking from our mind, they're not. They're Indian or they're Pakistani or they're Afghani. One time my son was saying something really funny. He's like, yeah, Ma Afghanistan, what did you have You're born in Washington Hospital. <laughs> I know Afghanis aren't liking that. Afghanis are not gonna like that. Afghan to the bone, three generations down, you're Afghani. You're not. They're not. Are they? They're not. Kuchishan Bahwan me mana. We speak to them Farsi, they answer us in English. That's Afghan. <laughs> Literally. We speak to them Urdu, they speak back English. We speak to them Pashto, they're speaking back to us in English. It's true, of course. I know how it goes. We were different, but they're completely a different ballgame. With that being said, this is why I'm saying that in this day and age, two things. Love and logic. Show them love and explain to them with logic. We can't do the same tactics that we used to do. You know? The, 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 the greatest tool of rectification was the chablak, chappal. Right? Chappal was number one. It was the best tool of straightening somebody out. Right? But in this generation, right, that's, that's not going to work. The only thing that's going to work is love and logic. That we show them love and we explain to them the right thing with logic. So it's different. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Quwa anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, he says, Quwa anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. What is the meaning of that? Save yourselves and your families from hellfire. So it's a couple of things that the Mufassirin, the scholars of Tafsir, they mention. He says, by opening up the doors of goodness for them. That any khayr that you see, any good that you see, put them on that. Make it possible for them. Putting them in programs that are going to make them good people. Putting them in environment that are making them, make them become good people. My brothers and sisters, I apologize if I say certain things and if I come out like I'm complaining. But we grew up, you know, we grew up going to these family weddings, weddings of relatives. I'm a 10-year-old kid and I see 
old people drinking at the bar. There would be bars, there would be drinking. I would see men and women dancing. I would see people drinking in bars. And I'm a 10 year old kid. We don't think about it as parents. I, you know, now that I think about it, I get shocked. How they let us, a 10 year old kid seeing a drunk guy, drunk 80 year old guy dancing on the, <laughs> on the floor, crazy things. How? How do we allow that? How do we say that's okay? And then we think that that's not gonna affect our kids. Close that door. Don't allow that door to be opened in their eyes for them to be able to see something like that at the age when, if they see it when they're old, it doesn't matter. Now they can, they can understand that. But a child seeing that when they're 10, 11, 12, 13, and what happens is we completely lose all sense when it is a wedding. When there's a shadi, or there's a wedding, or there's something like that that's going on, and we completely lose all sense of, you know, what is right, what is wrong, everything, anything goes. It's like, you know, our, our Islam is just on pause for that one night. Islam is on pause. Everything is, everything is okay. Go, do it. You have one night. Who said that? Who put it on pause? But we do that. We have to close those doors. Don't expose them to such things. Right? If you have a television in the house, this is one of the most dangerous things. If we have an internet inside the room and they lock it, or you give them as this device, and they go inside their room and they have access to it, you're, you've destroyed them. You've destroyed them. You're giving them free access to go, go my son, go destroy yourself. Close that door. Or keep it open for them. So yes, we have the internet, we have the thing right here in the living room. Where everybody's sitting here, so I can monitor you, I can watch you. What are you watching? What are you... Some people think that this is you know, you're policing them. You don't need to police them. You just have to let them understand that there are rules and regulations in this house. There's rules. It's not policing anybody. If they understand and this taught to them, we're Muslim, we don't do those things, these things destroy us. My kids always ask me, Why, what is alcohol? Why is alcohol bad? What is smoking? Why is smoking bad? I tell them, you know, this is what it does to you. It kills you. It hurts you. Right? It destroys you. It messes you up. It makes you crazy. You know, explaining to them that from a young age they understand these things. No, 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 this is haram, this is haram. You're going to go to hellfire. Right? What, about, what about hellfire? Right here in this world you become hellfire. In this world your whole life goes off. In this world your whole life becomes destroyed. Tell them about that. Show them. Let them see that. This is what happens when people go to prison. This is what happens when people become addicted to drugs. This is what happens to them. So... Opening up all the doors of goodness for them. And keeping away them from all of those things that might hurt them. Tell them what are the benefits of praying. A lot of kids ask, why do we pray? I don't even know why we pray. I don't even know why we're Muslim. You have, we have to explain these things to them. It's not like we were back home. Tell them why we pray. Tell them the benefits of prayer. Tell them the benefits of being a Muslim. Tell them the benefits of wearing hijab. Tell them what happens when a person doesn't wear hijab, when a person doesn't have uh, uh, haya and modesty. What happens? Tell them these things. And everything and all the problems that we see in society, this is what happens. This is exactly what happens. And explain to them batil. Explain to them falsehood and evil and wrong and what happens. iman. And warn them, and teach them, and show them, educate them. وَعَرِّفُوهُمْ بِأَحْوَالِ iman. Tell them about what are the signs of Iman. Tell them the stories of the pious people. Tell them the stories of the good people. One of the most beneficial things, my dear brothers and sisters, that I did, is when I took my children for Umrah. Allah, oh, they're too young, and they're going to die, and I don't know what's going to happen, and Maymur, I don't know, Atish all these things they were saying, they're going to burn, they're going to this, whatever, you know. People take their kids like, you know, all different places. Nobody has these problems. When I took my kids for Umrah, Wallah, it changed their entire life. It increased their iman. People take their, you know, their kids, you know, camping and God knows putting them in the mouth of the bear and all these other things. And they're afraid to take them in the, in, in, yeah. They do the zip lining and God knows what. Going 50 miles per hour down, down the slopes. People do that kind of stuff with their kids and they're afraid to take their kids for Umrah so they can see the house of Allah. 
So they can see that the, the, the grave of the Prophet وسلم, the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, what does that do to them? My, my, my son told me something. He said, you know, Dad, it's amazing. I didn't know there were so many Muslims in the world. I didn't know there's so many Muslims. Because he see, he think this is Islam. Oppressed and people living in a minority. And you see, oh, the entire country, Azan, everybody closing their shop. Everybody going to the masjid, not a single person is not praying. Everybody is praying. Everybody is going to the masjid. What that did to them, they came back and subhanAllah said, yes, I'm proud to be a Muslim. Islam is very good. I'm proud to be a Muslim. And children that never ever see that, and they just have to take your word for it. They just have to take your word for it. What is your word? Okay, I guess I trust you. Muslims are good, but they're really not good. Every time I come to masjid, they yell at me. When they go there, they're like, oh, subhanAllah, look at this. So, opening up those doors, showing the beauty of Islam, as much as we can, our fikir, our khiyal, just like we are in our businesses, just like we are in making money, just like we are in the way we look at our worldly things, and paying our houses off, and paying the bills, and giving rent, just like we have that concern. Number one concern will be in our mind as well, is the iman of our children. The deen of our children. So, this is something extremely important. Another very important thing is, who does your children accompany? Whose company are they in? Whose company are they in? This is the thing that affects the most after tarbiyat of the, children, of the kids. Is who do they accompany? Who do they hang out with? And you could put your kids in hips. You could bring your kids to the masjid, and as soon as you let them go for six hours a day in public school, then this is what they're going to pick up. We went to school. I tell you my experience. From Newark Elementary to Newark Junior High to Newark Memorial to San Francisco State University. This was my taraqi or tanazul, whatever you want to call it. It was taraqi, but it was tanazul. It was progress, but it was degress. Everything bad that you can imagine, we learn. Only the mercy of Allah Ta'ala, right? Only the mercy of Allah Ta'ala was the thing that saved us. Because that mentality, right? Go, he's getting educated. Yeah, he's getting educated on a lot of other things as well. Understand that. I'm not saying don't send your kids to school. That would be wonderful if you don't. If you have Islamic school, or if you have home study. When I went to homeschooling, other than few Muslims that were there, many of them were non-Muslim white Americans. Why? Because they know that, that what the harms of these public schools are, what it does. It literally, you're, you're building the building and then there's somebody else breaking it down. You're building the building and then there's somebody breaking it down. You're constructing the building and somebody's demolishing the building. That's basically, they're gonna be, it's gonna be your life. I know this is hard, my dear brothers and sisters, but understand that this is one of the most important things of a Muslim community. Not only building masajid. MashaAllah, masajid are wonderful. We're building masjid after masjid. Right? We're building institution after institution. What we need is Islamic schools with proper teachers that we can see that, okay, there's not going to be drugs in the school. There's not going to be bullying in the school. There's not going to be bihayai in the school. Alhamdulillah, that this is being done. And Alhamdulillah that we see this happening, you know, with ICF and with, you know, uh, 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 Peace Village, mashallah, in Lowry Masjid. And we have the MCA, uh, what we have there in, in, in Santa Clara. This is one of the most important things, to save them from that evil environment. Because otherwise, you're just going to be what? You're going to be building and that they're going to be demolishing. So this is something extremely important to constantly be concerned about. Another important thing is, is all of the means by which our children will become. We have to take the asbab. A lot of, I just got a call recently about a about 19, 20 year old boy and the mother was complaining that, you know, he is yelling and he's disrespecting and he's cussing me out and so on and so forth. And, He's getting violent inside the house and all of these various different types of things. So in reality, I said, you know, we never seen this boy. Where, where has he been? 
And did you ever send in the maktab? No, we never send in the maktab. He doesn't know how to read the Quran. Now I want him to come. He's 20 years old. 19? 19 or 20. He just finished high school. And he was working for a little bit. So she said, I want him to come to the masjid and learn Quran. Oh, Allah. You want a 20-year-old boy now to come and sit with like 10-year-old kids and learn Quran? Just think about that. I said, I will teach him personally. I will do that. But my dear sister, this 15 years where... Chimegan, Chimchan Arbud, right? They say that the, 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 uh, the, 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 the branch was very green and soft. The branch was green. It was soft. It was malleable. At that age, you did it. Now when he's 20 years old and he's a straight branch, if I'm going to straighten him, he's going to break. I will teach. I can't put him with... You, you're, you're telling me, Abida and you're going to take a 20-year-old boy and put him with a 10-year-old boy. 20-year-old man, and you're going to come and make him sit, and he's going to learn Quran now. He's not going to learn Quran now. I teach him. One-on-one, -on -one, yes, I have to put extra time. I'm not saying that there's no hope. But I'm saying that, my dear brothers and sisters, the Imams and the Qadis, they're not magicians. Jadugar <laughs> Nesta. They're not Jadugar, right? And we're going to put our children with you. We're going to children put our children with you for one hour. And in one hour, you have to do magic trick. What is a magic trick? Make him like Junaid Baghdadi. Make him Junaid Baghdadi. Right? Make him, right, so smart like Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi. For one hour. And the rest of the six, seven hours, where does he stay? This is the expectation we have from the Qadis, from the Imams, from the teachers. That we're going to put him with you for one hour, and we're going to put him over there for six hours. What do you think he's going to become? This is a miracle. What we are experiencing, that our children are mashallah pious, our children are very good, that some people still remain Muslim, I think this is a miracle. It's a mojiza. It's a mojiza. It's the dua of our elders. They used to make this dua, Rabbi Jani Muqim as salati wa min dhuriyati. Many of our pious people made that dua. Maybe my grandpa made that dua. Maybe my great-grandpa made that dua. Oh Allah, make from our zuriyat pious Muslims. I think their dua is why some people are still Muslim. Otherwise, why would people want to even remain? For what? For what reason? Why would they? I don't see any reason why they would. They don't see the environment of deen. They don't see the akhlaq of deen. They don't see deen at home. They don't see deen outside. And the... Two minutes or five minutes or one hour that they see in the masjid. Is that going to have some significant effect on their lives? My dear brothers and sisters, I know I'm talking doom and gloom. I didn't want this to become gloomy, but it's becoming very depressing and gloomy. But I'm saying that these are things that should be brought to our attention. I want to be very practical. I look at things from extremely, extremely practical perspective. I don't try to make it that everything is all good. Everything is not good. There are severe, severe issues. Youngsters are literally leaving Islam. Youngsters are literally leaving the deen. And one of the reasons is, is because we have this immigrant mentality to send them to school, they'll learn on their own. I want my kids to learn on their own. This kid, learning, letting the kids learn on their own is like, oh, this is electricity. Let him touch it. He's going to learn on his own that you know, this will electrify him if he touches it. Yeah, and then he's going to die and that's the end of the story. He's going to die and that's the end of the story. So... Sometimes we become the means. That's the point that I'm making. We become the cause. There was a person who came and complained to Umar ibn Khattab that my son is not listening to me. My son is not obeying me. My son is dis dis disrespecting me. So Umar radiallahu anhu called his son. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, I'm going to... He called his son. So then the son said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ma haqi ala walidi. <coughs> what right do I have on my father? So he says, أَن يُحْسِنَ إِخْتِيَارَ أُمِّكَ وَيُحْسِنَ إِخْتِيَارَ إِسْمِكَ وَأَن يُعَلِّمَكَ الْقُرْآنَ He says that your father should choose a good mother for you. That's going to give you good tarbiyah. And he should choose a good name for you. And also he should teach you the Qur'an and he should teach you the deen. So then he said, my father didn't teach me anything like that. You bring a 20-year-old kid, and then you say, this kid is yelling at me. And then I said, the kid has never even seen the masjid in his entire life. Now you're bringing him? You're doing it backwards. He said, he didn't do anything for me. 
He didn't give me a good name. And I wonder why it actually mentions what's his name and what, how, you know, all these different, different things. He says, go, you have disobeyed or you have cut off your son before he cut you off. You are the one who cut off your son before he could cut you off. So this is a very important thing for us to understand. Another thing is, be a good example. I had a friend of mine, a very close friend. So he had a bad habit of smoking. He had a very, very bad habit, cigarettes. He was a chain smoker. Very bad. And, you know, he did what he did. We kind of used to advise him. So one day I see him. He said, I said, SubhanAllah, Mujizah he said, Subhan, he said I, I left the cigarettes. I left these cigarettes. I said, this is a miracle. I said, what happened? I said, did the doctor say you got lung cancer? He said, no, 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 not that. Because <laughs> usually that's the thing that does it, right? He said, no, no, no. He said, congratulations, I had my first boy. I said, Siyaru Shabbat Namaste. You're a very smart guy. He said, I had my first son. And I need to give it up now because I don't want, us, I don't want my son to see me smoking. Because if I smoke, he said, my father smoked. Listen to this. He said, my father used to smoke. And he used to tell us, Bachin, don't ever do this. Don't ever, ever do this. This is bad. He said, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it. And he said, I remembered that. And said, if I'm going to do this, I just had my son. I just had my life. I don't want to be the one due to which he, I become the cause of him destroying his life. A lot of things our children do wrong is because they're just mirroring us. They're imitating us. They're reflecting us. We want our kids to be Junaid Baghdadi, but we're not becoming Junaid Baghdadi. We want our kids to be like Rabia Basriya, but we don't want to become like Rabia Basriya ourselves. This is, this is hypocrisy. So being a good example for them. Uqbat ibn Abi Sufyan, he said something to his son. He said, That the first thing you should do to rectify your own son, to rectify your son, is to rectify yourself. As soon as you read, and this is why I told you the story of, he said, I gave it up, that's it, no more cigarettes, because the only way that I can have my son be on straight is if I'm straight myself. I want my children to read Quran, but I don't read Quran. I want my children to pray, but I don't pray. I want my children to tell the truth, but I don't tell the truth. How can this be? Another very important thing, my dear brothers and sisters, is making dua. Making dua for our children. Wallahi, you know, our elders and our grandparents, the duas that they used to make, oh Allah, make from our zuriyat and our children that they remain Muslims, that they stay pious. Wallahi, the effectiveness is very, very powerful. Right? Because the dua, one of the most accepted duas is the dua of the parent for the child. This is one of the most accepted duas because it comes from the heart. It really, really comes from the bottom of your heart when you make dua for your children. And this is something that all of the Anbiya alayhim salam did. Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam, what did he say? Rabbi habili min as Oh Allah, give me righteous children. And Ismail alayhi salam, Rabbi ja'al, Rabbana wa ja'alna muslimayni laka wa min dhurriyatina. Ismail alayhi salam is making this dua. And Zakaria alayhi salam, he's making the dua. Rabbi habali min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiba. Oh Allah ta'ala, give me righteous progeny. So this is something that even the Anbiya alayhi salam, they did. So we should not neglect that. Always, sincerely, we should have a time that we make dua for our children. And another point is, don't leave your children for somebody else. They're not anybody else's responsibility. They're your responsibility. And if we put them with the imam, or we put them with the qadi, we put them with the maktab, we, put them, we take them to the masjid, many fathers and mothers, they come, mashallah, they park their car here, they put their kids for one hour. That's not enough. It's not his responsibility. And the example of what the imam sahab is doing is like he's putting paint on the walls. That's it. That's all the imam sahab does. The Imam Sahib, or the Qali Sahib, or the teacher, all he does is paint the walls. You're the one that puts up the walls. But if there's no walls, what is he going to paint? If there's no structure, if there's no foundation, what are they going to do? A lot of people think, right? 
Why are these ulama like this? And why is this imam like this? Oh, this imam is so bad akhlaq, and this imam is like this. It's, madrasa doesn't make you anything. The tarbiyah of parents makes you everything. Everything is with the tarbiyah and the upbringing of parents. School doesn't make you. School just, right, it just does the painting and the, what they call the paint job. School does the paint job. You're the one that builds the building. You're the one that raises the walls. You're the one that puts the roof. What can you do with a house that doesn't have any walls? It doesn't have any windows? It doesn't have any roof? And then you're going to blame, hey, where are you going to... There's no paint for me to put anything on. There's nothing for me to put paint on. There's no walls, there's no roof, there's no anything. There's no ceiling. So we have to raise the structure. We have to build the structure. Once the structure is built, now when you give it to the imam, then it's going to shine. It's going to be very beautiful. And another point is keeping them with you. Keeping them with you. We have to live during their life of their tarbiyat of our kids. We have to live good. We have to live straight. We have to live a righteous life. And we have to keep them with us. Father should keep the son with himself. It's mentioned about the father of Shaykh Muhammad Zakaria. Shaykh Muhammad Zakaria Kandelawi. He wrote 16 volume commentary in the Arabic language on the Muatta of Imam Malik. In almost every Arabic institute in the universities, he's one of our teachers' teacher, Hazrat Sheikh Maulana Zakaria. He wrote 16 volume. Can you imagine? 16 volume book on the commentary of the Muatta Imam Malik. Muatta Imam Malik was one of the oldest books of Hadith, even before the Bukhari Sharif. He wrote 16 volumes in Arabic language. And you can see the Rais of Jami Al Azhar in Egypt, he has that in his library. Awjaz al Masalik fi Mu'attai Imam Malik of Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria. How did this boy become such a great man? It mentions that Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria's father, Sheikh Muhammad Yahya, he, they used to ask him and they invited him. He was a very big scholar. They used to invite him to many, many programs. Come and give bayan here, you know? Come and give bayan here and come and give bayan there. And they would pay all of his expenses to come and give lectures. Lectures of 10,000 people, 15,000 people. Isn't it wonderful, a scholar, having 10, 15,000 people listen to you? It's great. He would completely refuse all offers. And you know what his, 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 his he said, why? You're a scholar. You should be spending time with the people. People should benefit from you. He said, there's other scholars that can benefit the people. But Allah has given me a son, and that son is my first responsibility. When I go for five days, one week, Two weeks. Who's going to be raising him at home? The ladies. I don't want the ladies to be raising him. I don't want him to become a woman. He should be like this. Very straightforward. I want him to be a man. And I'm going to keep him with me. And I'm going to be here watching him. He's going to look for that opportunity. When's my dad not there? Where's my dad not going to be there so I can do my work? This is what they're looking for the opportunity. But as long as the presence of the father is there... Just the presence of the father in the house, it keeps everything in. It keeps everything. And I'm not talking about that, mother, that, that couple that, mashallah, the mother is Rabia Basriya. And mashallah, she's also, you know, master's degree, doctor, PhD. And she can also cook the wonderful biryani and qabuli palau. And, you know, you have those one women that is equal to a hundred women. You have something like that as well. The father's not there, the mother takes care of it. There's situation like that as well. But that's not all throughout the board. Right? For some people, that might be, they might have to do that. But that's not the situation. So an important thing is keeping them with you, spending quality time with them. Like I said, when we, when we brush them off and say, I don't have time. Go, go tell your mom, I, I, I don't have time to listen to you. What that does to the kids. What that does to children. It messes them up. And this is the example of what the Prophet ﷺ would do. He would carry on the same camel with him, Ibn Abbas, and he would give him advice. And he would carry and ride with him, Osama ibn Zayd. And he would carry on the camel with him, Fadl ibn Abbas. These are young children. And the Prophet ﷺ would make them ride on the, on the camel. Can you imagine? The Prophet ﷺ was like the king. He was like the sultan. He was the king. He was the leader. But he would have little children riding with him. And when he would ride with them, he would teach them. And what he would teach them, this is one hadith. Where when Abdullah ibn Abbas, 
was riding with him. He said, Oh my son, are you listening to me? He said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. Labbaik ya Rasulullah. Labbaik. He said, Let me tell you some advice. He said, if you guard Allah, Allah will guard you. And if you guard Allah, Allah will be with you wherever you are. This is the advice that he would give little children when they're riding with him. Spending time with them. Making them go with you. Making them drive with you. When you come to the masjid to pray namaz, bring them with you. Don't let them sit, sit at home and watch YouTube. Come with me. Come to the masjid with me. Give YouTube a break for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. When you do that, what happens? It affects them, right? A lot of things are learned just by accompaniment, just by them being with you. I just give an example. That there was a, there was a, 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 a father, he said, I bring my son to every Friday. I don't know if my son knows anything, if he even learns anything. So one day I asked him, I said, Baba Barma Bubu Kchi Yad Girifti. He said he read the whole khutbah in Arabic to me. Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, and Astahinu, and Astaghfiruhu, and Uminu, and Atawakalu Ali, and Audu Bilai, and Shurid, and Fusina, and Sayyadima. So I, the, the, the father brought the son to me. He said, Mawlana Sab, here, listen. He said, Look, I just by bringing my son, they said, he said, I just bringing him. He's from five years old to ten years old. I never asked him. One day I said, did you, did you learn anything coming here? He brought the son, the son read, he made a few mistakes, but I'm saying even that, you're just sitting there and listening. He said, yeah, I, I know most of it. I was, I was really shocked. That the boy, just sitting and coming to the masjid with his father, he learned almost word by word. He made a few mistakes here and there, but imagine, he didn't go home and then read it and then practice it and then memorize it. No, just by sitting and coming to Jummah with his father. And Jummah comes once a week. And some weeks he doesn't even go. He comes usually like three times a month or two times a month. But the effect of that was such, just having them with you in good places. And just like they hear the good things, then know when they're with you, they hear the bad things. If that boy, he memorized an entire khutbah just by being with his dad. And the dad, he just, okay, go and sit over there. Go and sit over there. And he learned the entire khutbah. Now imagine when they're sitting with you, what's all the other bad things that they hear from us? The ghibat that they hear, the lying that they hear, the other conversations that we have. They're like tape recorders. They're like, one, one time my son was saying, he said, Oh, you shut up. I said, where did you learn shut up? He said, you said it the other day. <laughs> okay, you got it. Shut up. Sorry. Don't say it. If I said it, but don't say it. This is... We're the ones. We, we opened the door. Why did you say How did you say shut up? I heard you say it. You said it the other day. So, just like they hear all the good things when they're with us. And this is why if we really understand tarbiyat of children, tarbiyat of children should be the greatest means by which we rectify our own selves. Tarbiyat of children should be the greatest means which becomes our own islah, our own rectification. And more than anything else, my dear brothers and sisters, in this day and age, softness, kindness, muhabbat, playing with them, doing with them, right? being with them. In this day and age, those old tactics of being harsh with them, punishing them, taking things away from them, you know, getting angry with them. You have to have discipline. I'm not, I don't doubt that. You have to have discipline. You have to raise your voice once in a while. You have to put your foot down once in a while. You have to set the boundaries once in a while. But most of the time, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُعْطِي مَعَ الرِّفْقِ مَا لَا يُعْطِي مَعَ الْعُنْفِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you through kindness and gentleness that which He doesn't give you through harshness. When we... Raise our children with gentleness, with softness. We can achieve that which we cannot achieve through harshness. And the final words that I want to say is when we do this, my dear brothers and sisters, the great benefit will be returning back to you. This is the greatest thing. Okay? When you do all of this, when you go through this dar the sun, when you go through this big responsibility and hardship, what is going to happen? The greatest benefit is إِذَا مَاتَ insan in قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثَةٍ When a person dies, everything comes to an end except three things. Number one, 
Sadaqatul Jariyah. That sadaqah that you gave, you built the masjid, you helped contribute to the masjid, you, you, you put up the carpets of the masjid, you contributed to an institution, you contributed to a yatim khana. What happens? That is something that even after you die, if that place is standing, you will be getting the reward of that in your qabr. That's one number one. Number two, ilmun yuntafa'u bihi. Knowledge that you conveyed to somebody, a book that you published, or something that you gave, the, you support, so that book can be published and many people could benefit from that. A Qur'an that you pass down, that that Qur'an is read by somebody. This is also something which will benefit you after you've gone in your grave. And last and final, is that pious child, that when you are in the grave, every namaz that that child prays because of you, you will be getting the reward of his namaz. You'll be getting the reward of his fasting. You'll be getting the reward of his hajj and umrah. Every time he makes dua maghfirat for you, he will be elevated. It is mentioned in one hadith that a person, his maqam will be elevated in paradise. He said, Ya Allah, why is my maqam being elevated? He said, this is to the dua of your son who is making dua for you. He said, I did not have this maqam. I did not have this status. He said, but you made the effort. Somebody might say, but he doesn't make an effort. How is Allah Ta'ala going to give him a, a, a big rank in paradise? He didn't do anything. You should be given reward only to what you do. But isn't the tarbiyat of children something that you did? Tarbiyat of your children is your kasb. Tarbiyat of your children is your earning. Tarbiyat of your children is your aman. Tarbiyat of your children is your work. You work hard. And now, even when you're in Jannah, you might be in stage one. But to the dua that you made so much effort on that child, to that dua, to the tarbiyah of children, you might be in stage one, Allah will put you in stage five, six, seven, eight, hundred. All to the barakat of the effort. That is your effort. Somebody says, well, he's getting into Jannah for no effort that he made. But that is your effort. That you taught that child something. You instilled that child with some concern that now he's saying, oh Allah Ta'ala, elevate the ranks of my father. Forgive my father. Grant him Jannah. Elevate his ranks. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala give us the understanding of this. And may Allah Ta'ala make us good examples for our children. And may Allah Ta'ala give us the ability to make tarbiyat of our children. And may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala make us from amongst those who reap the benefits of this. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah.